everybody, welcome back to the land place of Binding of Isaac Atrith Plus. Coming at this from a new perspective a few hours later. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. 4BJY. TGRZ. You know there's no way I'm not taking that, but we're turning over a new leaf. We're busting out fires in the hopes of getting hearts. If it sounds like it could come from a bad pop song. If only I could sing. But this is where, you know, in the first chorus, it's a very breathy uh male vocal. It's, we're putting out fires in the hopes of finding hearts. And then that gives you a little space on the on the amplitude end. So that when you bring it back at the end, he goes, We're putting out fires in the hopes of finding heart. He goes really hard. I can't do it. I don't have the timbre, to be honest. But it's not that hard to be a multi-talented record producer, singer, songwriter. We just did it. That would go to number one. Eh... Number one is tough. Only a few songs every year do that, you know? And who knows what the populace is interested in. We'll, we'll, we'll call that a top ten adult contemporary bop. Anyway, don't get too distracted here early. You still got a spicy time of day. No spirit arts yet have presented themselves. But you gotta admit, of course, without a doubt, Epic Fetus is... Uh, an incredible item. You might say putting out fires and hoping to find hearts doesn't make any sense. What does that mean? Well, it's a metaphor, you know, is trying to deal with your catastrophes in order to work on yourself and, and be able to find love, be able to put yourself in a position where you can actually, you know, handle it once you get it because it's hot, hot, hot. But then also, it doesn't matter. Doesn't matter if it means anything because what does Ed Sheeran mean when he says, uh, everything's covered in something brand new. You might say what he actually meant is, uh, everyday discovering something brand new. In which case I would say, no, I don't think so. I don't believe that's the lyric. Yes, I did hit myself with Epic Fetus. There can be no doubt about this. This could be a pivotal moment for us. It's not gonna be. <laughs> but it could have been. I'm not worried about our deal with the devil. Like, as Judas, with Epic Fetus, what do we need from the deal with the devil? Look at it from a first principle standpoint. We have damage, but don't have HP. Most deals with the devil work in the opposite direction of what we'd be interested in then. They would take our HP and give us some damage. I wouldn't say no. To, to some damage upgrades of, of some specific import. However, we don't really need a general overarching damage upgrade. What we need is some kind of survivability and hopefully some way to, you know, protect myself when I continue to just be like really worse than I should be doing at, at Isaac, I, I've been hidden that level. It's an embarrassment, but it is what it is. Today has not been my day, but we can rebuild. We can go into tomorrow feeling okay about it. I did not mean to purchase it, but let me tell you something. I didn't mean to purchase it, but just because we purchased it does not mean we are forced into its use. We can refuse to use it, maybe following the deal with the devil, depending on what you get. We might feel like that's a little bit more open to us. No deal with the devil, we'll do a little bit more exploration. If we could get a lot of uh, spirit hearts, and that's obviously not going to hurt, I wouldn't mind using Potato Peeler. Having a second... Oh no. Wow, incredible placement. Having a second level uh, Meat Boy, or first level, even would be fine as well. Not better, but, you know, it costs you HP every every time you go down, so you gotta be careful. Um, 
Having an orbital would be nice to protect us from enemies that get close that we don't really have a good means to hit without putting ourselves at risk of, uh, you know, getting hit ourselves with Epic Fetus. So I think that's where we're at right now. Those are my my sense to end otherwise. A three cent spirit heart is a is a fantastic bargain. Five cent spirit heart does keep us from buying any other items that are not half price, but I think it's worth a shot anyway. Five bombs at a penny each. That's a good market price, brother. Wouldn't have minded either of the real items there, but that's okay. That's not really that useful, honestly. Key for three cents. Eh. Spirit heart for three cents. Tickles my fancy quite a good bit more. So, yes, but I'm gonna resist the temptation. I don't believe we want to take it any deeper than that. Phrase it. Um... Because we're likely to get a deal with the devil on the next floor. In fact, I would say it's pretty much a certainty unless we somehow find a way to die. Um, hold on, what are you? Pheromones. Yes. More than enough keys now. It's actually really good because we don't really need bombs at all. And our rate of fire is uh, unconcerning right now. So this all worked out pretty well. But I would like to have some fodder for a deal with the devil on the next floor. And I think that's exactly what we got. Very few complaints are on offer. Hmm. So far, so good. I really think sometimes... It's really, to be honest, I think one of the triggers that I have for being bad at Isaac is when I record Isaac episodes in a little bit of a time crunch. But it's not so simple to just say, don't record them in a little bit of a time crunch. Because, you know, it's a very silly thing to complain about but you never know wow six relax pills um you never know how long an isaac episode is gonna take you know some of them you're, you're constantly bidding on a silent auction in a temporal sense i love how i started explaining it you know in a way that is uh you know, just using common English, and instead I took a step back and said, wait a minute, why do that when an over-bloated and impossible-to-understand metaphor will work? Here's what I mean. It's 1 p.m., you got an obligation at 2. Nothing to worry about. 99% of Isaac episodes, probably even more, probably, probably like 99.6%, I would say like, you know, one a year, ends up going over an hour in length. You got nothing to worry about. And people will understand if you're five minutes late and you're like, yeah, I had an 80-minute Isaac run. They'll be like, okay, I get that. Um, at least people on, you know, if you're late for your stream. If you're late for something in, in the meat space, I got no answers for you. Um, that one is a no-brainer. You're going to be fine. I kind of hate these. Maybe we'll get a little Mega Satan run going here. Um, what about... 115. How do you feel about that? What percentage of Isaac episodes are under 45 minutes? It's got to be like at least 80%, probably like 90% to be honest. I'd say the average length probably ends up being around 35 minutes. Um, the, the very smooth brain option is you go, well, just only record if you have an hour then. Okay, but what do you do? With the intervening period within that hour, you know, you got to find something to fill that space and sometimes you need Isaac episodes. Most of the time, when I put myself in a little bit of an Isaac time crunch, you don't even notice. It's totally fine. I give myself 50 minutes, the run's done in 33, I got 17 minutes, I go eat some lunch. It's a nice situation. But it's like the, the 5 to 10% of the time. That's where things get wonky. That's why I call it a silent auction, right? Like in a silent auction, I really feel like a silent auction is, if it's for charity, that's fine. Apart from that, I don't like it. Because you don't know what the optimum amount to spend is. I feel like a silent auction, I mean, that's pretty sweet. We haven't had Sprinkler in a long time. I feel like a silent auction benefits the seller too much. And an auction already can benefit the seller because people get sucked up into the frenzy, right? They're like, going once, going twice, they get excited. They're like, Honey, you can't let him get away with that jet ski. All of a sudden, you're buying, you know, Pablo Escobar's jet ski. It's $35,000, and you're like, I only came here with 
the idea of spending 300 bucks. But a silent auction is even worse, because you you basically it asks you to walk up to an item and go, how much would you feel happy paying for this? And you're like, I don't know, 50 bucks? And you're like, congratulations, the next lowest bid, $3. You just paid $47 extra. Isn't that fun? I can't think of a situation in which a silent auction really benefits uh, <laughs> the buyer. I might be mistaken, but... I, I have won a silent auction once in my life, I will say. When I was in middle school... This is not a joke, it's a very Canadian story. When I was in middle school, I... Uh, I bid $10 on a local business at a silent auction. The local business painted hockey sticks. $10 ended up being the winning bid. And I never redeemed my prize because I do not play hockey. But I was excited because I had won the silent auction for that item. I was like, that's amazing! I won the right to purchase a service. I could have purchased a la carte for the same exact premium. I just, I don't support a, a silent auction. But dude, I get invited, like, because I uh, have purchased Canucks playoff tickets once. In order to get on that list, I had to give them, you know, my phone number, email address, yada, yada, yada. Sell them, you know, the rights to my firstborn son's rap single, etc. Um, that's the name of the single, etc. It's coming out real soon. Open parentheses, putting out fires. Um, I get invited to every Canucks memorabilia auction, and I am just stunned how many people will spend like hundreds of dollars on sports memorabilia constantly. I know that I'm not trying to put, you know, any any shame on anybody's hobbies, but like, you know, they, they've been doing these special jersey nights. They'll have like, the players will warm up in a cool jersey. And then uh, once they're done with the warm up, you can actually buy the worn jersey, like the, the one that they warmed up in, um, after the game via like an internet auction. And like, if you want to buy one of the really superstar players jerseys it's gonna cost you like maybe up to two grand which is just crazy i think i mean it's it's very very expensive let's we'll start there but also you're like man that was a game where we lost like eight to two <laughs> you really would ah yes that's uh quinn hughes's jersey from when we uh got absolutely obliterated by a team we should have probably held our own against it's kind of a weird memory, but it, it's a cool, it's a cool piece of merchandise. There's no doubt about that. But what gets me is people are like, two thousand dollars for Quinn Hughes's game worn jersey? Absolutely not. That's that's too much money. What I will do is pay seven hundred dollars for a fourth liners game worn jersey, who probably won't even be on the team one year from now. It's just too much. I mean, it's already you know it's expensive to go to the games. Whenever I always open the email because i assume like hey maybe one day people will forget and i'll be able to get a bargain literally will never happen um there's always people are like jordy ben game worn chinese new year jersey yeah that seems like an 800 hundred dollar purchase i don't i don't know about that one maybe it's christmas inflation i got nothing against jordy ben I'm just saying. I like to think that there's just one person out there with an incredibly specific collection. <laughs> I own all of Zach McEwen's, and these are, even if you were into hockey, you're probably like, who's Zach McEwen? Look, it's not, I'm, I don't mean to disrespect you, Zach, but you are constantly rebounding between the AHL and the NHL on a, Franchise on the West Coast where most people you know that watch hockey are probably asleep by the time the games even come on Anyway, uh, sports ball sports ball <laughs> We're back where are we at dank depths one making great time and I mean let's be honest not likely to run into trouble The only trouble I'm gonna run into is in the court of public opinion because I've taken sprinkler and used it zero times 
you do find yourself in this design pit from time to time. You know, when your Isaac run is, forgive my verbiage here, when your Isaac run is too strong, you sometimes find yourself not using items that would benefit you. Because you're like, well, why would I use, you know, the sprinkler when I have Epic Fetus? Epic Fetus is already, you know, crushing it for me like Gary Vaynerchuk. Let me out, please. That was a very spooky moment. Anyway. None of that really is relevant. We'll make it... We'll use it on the boss, okay? But I don't want to use it yet, because we might have the boss right around the corner. You never know. It's been a good week on YouTube. I've been playing uh, a lot of new games, you know? I. It feels like once every few months I talk about this, and it always happens. It's, it's a lot like building a habit, you know? So I'm trying to introduce new variety into the channel. It usually... I, I, I really feel a pull for new variety in the channel. I think it's important because, you know, there's a diehard group of people that will watch anything. And there's a, you know, a group of diehard people that's slightly larger that will watch Isaac. And then, you know, you still need new blood every now and then in order to keep things healthy. I think the variety helps out a great deal in Discovery, which helps out a great deal with that. So, usually, and I'm already like, I'm five videos up. I've been, you know, working on this video series where uh, I play stuff that's come out or stuff that I've just become familiar with. I give my impressions on it, but we really discover what it's all about together, as opposed to something where I've played a couple hours of it in advance and give you my thoughts. I kind of give it to you more organically as we, as we go. Um, what usually happens is it's not a lack of desire. It's the same thing that happens to any habit. Ah, I didn't know it worked like that. I am frightened. <laughs> Please stop. Oh my god, that's horrible, dude. Hilarious, but horrible. Let me out. Um. So yeah, I mean, you know, you, you get... Uh, Pinched, you know, you run out of time on one day and you're like, ah, all I got time to do is record Isaac. Then you're like, oh, it's been four days since I did this. And then you're like, ah, it's been six months since I had anything on the channel that wasn't Tetris or Isaac. But uh, we're not in that state right now. And I'm going to work hard to make sure the odds of us finding ourselves in that state are lower. It's always fun to check out new stuff. Not all of it is, you know, a hit or a fit for a long-term feature on the channel, but it's always nice to be able to play uh, new games. And I, I've kind of, I miss that, you know, because I, I do like the duty of repetition. People make fun of me for it all the time, but it's true. I like repeatable, menial tasks that don't require that much uh, higher executive function from the cerebral cortex like playing Isaac it's not that the game is easy because I think a lot of people wow that was really bad I'm starting to think we might be in a, a tighter spot than I thought here by the way but a lot of people seem to be under the the impression that Isaac is hard which is hilarious but it's more that I've played so much of it that a lot of the stuff that you know goes on in the game is basically routine slash automatic for me um, and I like that. I take pride in being able to push out, you know, a, a stupid amount of content uh, consistently. The problem is, sometimes you gotta recognize, you know? At least, not only from a business standpoint, but also from like a burnout standpoint. You know, maybe one non-Isaac video <laughs> could carry the weight or the value of like four Isaac episodes. Not necessarily in terms of viewership, but in terms of like your own enjoyment, the enjoyment of your audience, you know, the community building, etc, etc. Also intangible stuff, like some of the games I've played, I'm like, oh dude, now that I have a familiarity with this, I would love to stream it a little bit. So I hope you guys have been enjoying that. Uh, if you haven't checked it out, it's usually, for now, it's been in the 10 a.m. time slot. Checking out new stuff. I'm sure there will be hiccups as we figure it out, but uh, for now, having a having a darn good time. Played Grifflins, Clay's new game, uh, which was a lot of fun.
played Frog Detective 2, which to be honest, very cute and irreverent, but not necessarily 100% up my alley. That's definitely and decidedly not a me game, I think, for the most part. Still cool. Cross Nick Plus. Cross Nick, sorry. Which was a uh, Dreamcast-inspired Y2K aesthetic uh, relaxing puzzler. Hades, revisited Hades, which is the uh, Hellenic-inspired roguelite from Supergiant, who also made Bastion and Transistor. Also got a chance to check out Nova Drift from Pixel Jam Games. You may remember them from Dino Run. I told you. I got the names. They're, they're hooked up. It's encyclopedic. Okay, we got a great setup here. Holy Mantle is disgustingly good. I know what you're thinking. Go to Boss Rush. Put down Sprinkler. Generate as many Sprinklers as possible. Revel in the chaos. Hopefully you know what I'm thinking as well, which is... No! Absolutely not. We will take this just to take this. I'm not saying we won't use the Sprinkler. But definitely, I don't have much interest in doing boss rush. And Tetris, in case you didn't see on Twitter. Like, here's the thing. I would never encourage you to follow me on Twitter, because honestly, I just don't care about my numbers there. Um, and I don't tweet that much important stuff. But if you're ever wondering where videos have gone, there, 100% of the time, it's addressed on Twitter. So that, just for the future, if you're ever looking for that information, that's where to find it. But, uh, yeah, Tetris is gone. I'm still playing it in my downtime. It's still a lot of fun, but, you know, I think that the, the Tetris train has sailed. Even when they added squads. I played some squad matches, and I was like, eh. It's, I mean, it's, it's fun, and I think we'll definitely play some on stream or maybe even on video with, you know, Dan or... Uh, probably me and Kate will play some, I wouldn't be surprised. But, uh... Even when I was playing it, I was like, it's it's still obviously just Tetris. This doesn't change it enough to be like, let's do another 30 episodes. If anything, this is gonna sound very ridiculous. But, if anything, a mode in Tetris where your odds go from, uh... 1 in 99 to 1 in 4 is almost a little bit less compelling to me. Because it makes the wins feel a little cheaper. But you are playing against the more organized block of, of opponents as well. The Game Awards are tomorrow night. I don't know why I'm segueing into this as if, like, I'm Jay Leno. Hey, did you hear the Game Awards are tomorrow night? Yeah, I hope they give out the uh, best Pac-Man. <laughs> you can't see my face, but you can imagine the face I made. Oh, I heard the best Pac-Man award is going to go to Donkey Kong this year. I like this bit. Incredibly unfair to Jay Leno bit. Plus bad impression of him. Assuming he, he knows nothing about the video gaming industry. Boy, I sure hope Mario rescues the princess this year. You're crazy, Jay. He's always saying crazy stuff. Jay, you can't say that. The gamers are gonna be mad, dude. Jay doesn't care. He'll go there. He doesn't give a hoot, dude. What are you gonna do? Uh, make me give up one of my 400 cars? <laughs> Not worth it. You're gonna have to make a compelling offer if you want me to cross the, the spike trap there. None of that is even close, dude. You have not even broached... I forgot I had Holy Mantle. <laughs> I could have done it at any time. That being said, we do not really want Cursed Eye. I think? I don't think it'll help. But uh, I'm stoked to have uh, Mulligan. Mulligan will help out a great deal. If it actually generates flies. It's three uh, Epic Fetus is not enough to tell if we can generate. But, you know, at that point, I think we might sadly have to recognize that we may indeed be incapable of generating uh, flies via epic fetus in which case the mulligan was not really useful at all to be honest unfortunately but it's the thought that counts i was talking about it on the nlss not a wise move 
But I, I think I've really come around on the Game Awards, you know? Like, my first impressions of the Game Awards are that they're, they occupy a very strange space because games occupy a strange space. Just strange space. They occupy a strange space, okay? Just because I said the word wrong, it doesn't undermine my point. Some video games are art. Some video games are a commodity. Um, some video games, in fact, I would probably argue most video games are both. The award show has always seemed to me as a way to bend over backwards to try to be like games are a grown-up medium. We have award shows just like other mediums, but that's been compromised in some way by the fact that the Game Awards themselves have straddled the line between advertising and prestige, you know? They give out like a Game of the Year award, but they also basically are, are mostly, I would say, watched as much for the, the nominations and the awards, they're, they're also watched for, uh, you know, new reveals and trailers and stuff like that, which seems super weird to me. Like, I thought, and uh, this is where I was thinking to myself in the shower today. I was like, what would the Oscars be like if midway through the Oscars, they were like, by the way, here's a trailer for, like, you know, Noah Bombatch's new movie. In the middle of the broadcast. Not in the commercial breaks that happen betwixt. <laughs> no, thank you. I really thought we'd get a chance to do Mega Satan here. Um... And then, I was, it, you know, the inner snob of me is like, well, if you're going to run a, an award show that has some level of prestige and, uh, you know, uh, decorum to it, you have to separate those two concerns. The advertising entertainment concern and the, you know, merit-based award concern. And then I thought to myself, no, you don't. That would be sick. <laughs> it might raise some questions. But those questions are not for me. Like, if I was watching the Oscars and they were like, by the way, we got a new trailer for, you know, the next Marvel movie, I would be like, yo, sick. Maybe the next day I would read the think pieces that are like, is, does this, what does this mean for the nature of critics being in bed with the filmmakers? But that night I would be like, yo, did you see the Spider-Man 3 trailer, dude? So I think that's what I've come to realize is that I think it'll just be an, a, a fun show, and don't take it too seriously. I don't take any award show seriously, and this sounds I I unbelievably snobby. You're gonna hate what I'm about to say, but don't boo me because I'm right. Um, I inherently don't respect as much. Let me rephrase. When I say respect, I don't mean like I think it's not worth anything. What I mean instead is that I think it, it can't be the definitive, like, you know, the best picture of games as long as it relies on popular vote for even a composite score. I don't, because I, the thing is, it's not that I think the people are incapable of choosing game of the year. It's the fact that I think the vote totals will be distorted based on popular games going up against games that are less popular. Which means that there's a compromised ability to award based on merit alone. Instead of being a game of the year, it's, it runs the risk at that point of being, uh, hey, this is the most well-liked game that was played by the widest cross-section of people. Waters down the, the merit of the award. Now, to be fair to the game awards, I believe popular vote is only like 10%, which is a low enough, like it's a 10%... Uh, of the factor that goes into scoring and the jury is the rest i think but um that's low enough to in my opinion be seem b is a strong word it's low enough to seem negligible and as a result it comes across as a way to get people involved and and you know make them maybe more likely to watch the show but not actually have you know a, a mob be able to control what wins and what doesn't but still you know there's if you based, uh, you know, like, what wins best picture based on what was the most well-liked movie in terms of, like, sheer number of positive votes, I think you would end up with a worse cross-section of, like, best picture winners. Which is why, me personally, I don't, uh... This just in, YouTuber Northern Lion says he doesn't respect the results of the popular vote. I didn't say that. What I said... So I think when it comes to awards shows, 
I prefer an award show that takes the popular vote out of it to some extent because there's an imbalance. In ter are we t are we trying to award the best game of the year? Or are we are trying to award the game of the year that was liked by the most people? Because I think those are two very different things. You know? Game of Thrones Season 8, by those metrics, might be the most well-liked television program this year. Sure, two-thirds of people that watched it hated it. But one-third of that viewing audience is still a huge number. Regardless. Basically, I said to myself, Why do you take yourself so seriously, you weirdo? Why don't you just shut up and watch the commercials and have a good time and... You know, celebrate the industry a little bit instead of always being wrapped up in like, mm, but the decorum. Won't somebody think of the ethical separations? I do think it's hilarious that the host is also in Death Stranding. I, I'm being 100% honest with you when I say that I don't believe there is any marionetting behind the scenes to make Death Stranding more likely to win as a result of Jeff Keighley being both the host of the show and present in the in the game. Because, I mean, it's, it's almost one of those things where you're like, first off, I believe that they've taken the necessary steps to separate that. Secondly, it's the most obvious possible separation or uh, lack of separation of concerns in history <laughs> so i plus you don't really you don't get anything for winning right i don't know i just that's one of those where i i could not you could not persuade me to believe the conspiracy theories it would be impossible to tell from the outside as well because death stranding is a game that's very well liked to begin with divisive in some ways but like overall there are millions of people who, who have liked or loved that game, for sure. Anyway. I'm looking forward to it. I just like award shows. It's true. I don't watch the movie ones. I definitely don't watch the TV ones. But I do like an awards show. There's just something about it, you know? I being Trying to predict what's going to win and then having a smug sense of satisfaction when you're right. Plus... My wife's nominated. I mean, indirectly. But, like, she worked on Cadence of Hyrule. She worked on the score for Cadence of Hyrule. And Cadence of Hyrule is indeed nominated for Best Score. So, I'm, I mean, you know what? Maybe I have my own bias. Maybe I got my own horse in the race. We'll have to find out come tomorrow. Anyway, thanks for watching. Thank you, Epic Fetus, for existing. If you enjoyed the episode, click the like button. It helps a great deal. Of course, subscribe if you want to see more in the future. If you're nice watching, I will. See you next time. See ya!